It's a great pleasure and honor that we have um, virtually with us here today, Professor Leon Monsoni from the University of um, Manchester. Um, Leon is professor of um, political theory at that institution. She's also editor of the journal Global Justice Theory Practice Rhetoric, and she has published widely in the areas of political philosophy, moral philosophy, um, political theory, um, and even some, some legal theory, often from a Republican perspective. And in addition, I should mention that she's also worked on questions of international um, tax justice. So some of her articles have um, dealt in particular with this um, topic. Um, today, she's going to present um, research, which is work in progress on how should Republicans conceive of uh, transnational um, solidarity, um, which is a very interesting and timely topic given the relevant motivation for the sense of um, global justice and international politics that Nira um, Monsoni is going to, to tackle today. Um, this is a, a hybrid um, event. So we have um, people here in the actual um, classroom at the University of uh, American University of um, Paris, and we will switch the camera so you can see the students actually from from the front in in a moment. And then we have a few colleagues from um, AUP joining, like uh, Roman Sinigrad and Steve Sawyer from um, the Center for Critical Democracy Studies. Um, colleagues from Frankfurt, like Dimitris. Uh, many colleagues from. Um, from Italy, Chloe from the, the PPE major, and many others that are joining today. So we have a very mixed, mixed crowd and a hybrid environment. So I'm glad that um, so many people have been interested in this um, talk um, today. And without further uh, ado, I'd like to give the word to, to Miriam, who will also share with you um, the handout for this talk, which she will post in the chat. So, Julian, the floor is yours. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks very much, Julian. Thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, I would have uh, loved to be in Paris instead, but uh, yeah, it is what it is. Huh? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I hope to be able to join you in the spring, however. So, uh, so hopefully uh, that will happen at least. Um, so um, just two things. First of all, I actually have shared the handout already. Why? Okay. Julian was introducing me. Uh, can you just uh, give me a sign if you um, if you haven't received it? Otherwise, I'm going to assume that you have. Um, I am sorry for not using a PowerPoint, but I've got I don't know mixed experiences about how PowerPoint actually works in these kind of settings. So um, uh, so uh, I've I've decided to try out something else. Um, let me know how you feel about it. Um, also, I, I'm just coming back from a conference in Sicily where I had my first experience with dual delivery. Um, and that was a bit of a tragedy. <laughs> I'm especially concerned for the people in person in Paris. Um, so, uh, Julian, please feel free to interrupt me at any point. I mean, usually in person, volume and clarity and uh, and presence, vocal presence, is not a problem that I have. But if I, if there's echo problems, if, if I'm too close to the mic, if for whatever reasons I'm not clear, I break up. Can you please interrupt me without any hesitation whatsoever, Julian? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'm um, hoping uh, that you all have the handout. Um, so this is really very much working. Probably, I, I wouldn't even say that it's a paper to be honest with you. And uh, not even going to be particularly apologetic about it because I think there should be space for things like that in, in seminars, really throwing out some reflections and trying to think together about them. And this is really what, um, uh, what um, I'll try to do uh, today. The title is How Should Republicans Conceive of Transnational Solidarity? And the way in which um, I've decided to try and present the general idea and even, even the way in which I will present it is, is work in progress in the sense that I'm not sure is the best way, but again, I'm, I'm gonna try. Is to first uh, 
come down uh, and home in on how I, uh, I think we should understand, or at least how I want to defend um, a specific understanding of the three key terms in question. So solidarity, transnationalism, and republicanism. And, um, and, then, um, and then basically you know, use these three understandings in order to answer the question how we should uh, understand transnational solidarity as, as Republicans. So first of all, what is solidarity? Um, and this is basically, um, and everybody who works on the, on the notion of solidarity, let alone people who work on the notion of uh, solidarity beyond uh, borders or across borders, transnational, whatever, people who want to expand or transform the notion of solidarity beyond usual settings, grapple with the fact that we actually, um, and, and that's, you know, that's common with, uh, with all sorts of conceptual analysis of political terms, ordinary language uses solidarity in a cluster of different ways, and there are some family resemblances, but that doesn't seem to be a univocal understanding, right? So, um, so as usual, an, under, an exercise in conceptual analysis is an, is an exercise in trying to remain faithful to ordinary language up to a point. So certain sacrifices need to be made and providing um, a justified rationale for why you're making uh, those sacrifices, right? So you have to say, this is how I understand it and this, this way of understanding makes sense. And on top of it, can make sense of most uses of the term solidarity in ordinary languages, but not some. So you have to commit to the idea that some cases in which we speak of standing in solidarity in, in ordinary languages are actually not quite accurate or stretched. So this is the way I propose we should do it. Um, I propose that even for those who disagree about pretty much everything else, so about more interesting uh, disagreement that I'm going to talk about later on, um, we should understand solidarity as different from broadly speaking, feelings motivated by charity or empathy for the plight of others without any further qualifications. So for the suffering, plight, bad luck of others to cure, right? So I want to say that even if you disagree about all other things, the feelings of solidarity are motivated primarily by injustice, oppression, domination, right? So not other people who are simply suffering, but other people who are suffering unjustly or other people who are um, being oppressed. Um, although you don't necessarily have to agree about what counts as justice and justice, even actually to share a feeling of solidarity, right? It can be much more coarse grained, right? It can be cases in which there's an overlap between different understandings. The idea that this is unjust or that this is a form of oppression is beyond reasonable doubt. So you only, do, you only agree about a minimal common denominator, but not necessarily about you know, how we understand justice and injustice down to the detail, right? So, um, and, and again, this is, this, is, this is the very first step. So it's independent of things that I'm gonna say later on about who stands in solidarity with whom. But basically I want to exclude usages such, such as standing in solidarity uh, with people for whom you feel sorry, period, right? So you feel uh, you stand in solidarity for people who are suffering for reasons that are acts of God or sheer bad luck. So I, uh, my, my friend is pregnant and I am not gonna drink wine tonight in solidarity with her. So I want to say that this is a, this is a stretched usage of the term solidarity. Um, and, and I think we actually do, um, do, you, do use it in that way quite, um, quite often indeed. So plight for the suffering of others that is motivated by injustice or oppression. So you stand in solidarity with victims of injustice and oppression, but then the issue then is why? And here again, there are different um, possibilities and I wanna restrict my field. I don't wanna say that um, only the one that I'm going to talk about counts as solidarity, that I'm not going to say. I'm going to say, uh, so the first step that I've taken is a step in conceptual analysis in saying this is what I call solidarity. I think other things are not solidarity. What I'm going to do from now on is to say these are three kinds of solidarity and, I, and I'm only interested in one for the sake of this talk. So it's a slightly different exercise. 
So you can stand in solidarity for those who are suffering and injustice with whom we have nothing to do, right? So um, I stand in solidarity uh, with, uh, with the victims of this injustice far away from me or even close to home, but for whom I'm not responsible, right? Solidarity is for the people who have been unjustly, unjustly dismissed from this, um, everything fine? I heard yeah. an echo, yeah. From, uh, from the victims of, sorry, for the people who have been unjustly dismissed uh, from this factory just down the road or even far away, but I stand in solidarity merely because they have suffered an injustice and nothing else. Or you can say that you stand in solidarity and quite often this is done with those who are suffering an injustice similar to something that you suffer or that you have suffered before. So the term is very often used in this way, right? You stand in solidarity because you know, you know what they're going through because you have been there or you are there yourself, right? So New Yorkers in 2005, for instance, saying that they were standing in solidarity with Londoners after the London July 20, um, 2005 terrorist attack. Or, and I think this is the more original, so the, sorry, the most original, original not in the sense of innovative, really in the sense of the oldest understanding of solidarity. Solidarity is standing in solidarity with those who suffer injustice because A, you are suffering the very same injustice and B, you need to stand in solidarity with them in order to actually overcome it, right? So I think this is the most, the most original, the primary notion, and we have sort of expanded it, but the one that actually I wanna talk about is primarily this one, right? So solidarity as lose class consciousness or class consciousness broadly conceived, not just in Marxist terms, right? So consciousness about those who are in my same situation and those with whom I need to coordinate in actually to actually get out of this. Or you might even say as enlightened self-interest, right? Recognizing that they're suffering too because we need to do something together. So you stand in solidarity, not with whomever is suffering an injustice, but with those people with whom you have, you must act together in order to end the problem, in order to solve the problem and end the oppression. So I am going to focus primarily on three because I'm, I'm basically in, interested in solidarity as a vehicle for political action, right? So what I want to say, solidarity is the kind of feeling that you need to foster in order to understand which kind of political action you need to engage in. Um, but also, so, it, so I'm primarily interested in this, basically, I'm primarily interested in what kind of transnational political action can fly, right? Which has any traction and is not just um, wishful thinking. But also I think conceptually is more interesting because um, uh, with respect to one calling these feelings and actions of solidarity adds no explanatory power, right? Rather than saying, I think I need to help them because they're suffering an injustice. So I, I don't think they may be our acts of solidarity, but I don't think we are adding anything interesting by saying that the acts of solidarity. And two is probably a very interesting phenomenon psychologically and phenomenologically, and maybe empirically we need to use it, right? Because if it's, true, if it's true that this happens a lot, we need to be able to mobilize it and exploit it. But I think it's more a psychological phenomenon rather than anything else, right? I don't think that you have, from a, from a normative perspective, I don't think that you have a reason to stand in solidarity with others simply because they have, because they have been through the same. Although you, of course, it makes sense for you to. And even epistemically, right? If you think that you have a duty to a one type, duty to help those who suffer injustice, it could be that you have two type obligations in particular, because as somebody who has been there, you have, um, you, you have some sort of epistemic uh, privilege from a sort of standpoint, ep epistemology point of view, you, you know the plight, and maybe you can contribute to the solution, right? Um, but I am interested here really in the, in the issue of those with whom you must act together, right? So solidarity, therefore, has really enlightened self-interest in this way, those who have to solve the problem with you, right? So the kind of examples of solidarity of this kind are, and you know, it's no exception, and here I'm at the end of the first um, section of the handout, is no exception that there are two very old and, and, and common, and some people might even say trite examples, but they're both 19th century examples, right? So they are as old as, as the concept of solidarity, right? 
So in a, in a Marxist perspective, the people with whom you have to stand in solidarity as, for instance, a labored, uh, a wage laborer or, or, a, or a worker in the capitalist system is other workers. In the first instance, maybe those in your factory or in your country, in the same jurisdiction, but ultimately all over the world, because they are the ones with whom you have to subvert the system. From a liberal nationalist perspective, it's your fellow national nationals or your compatriots, you know, those with whom you have to create a liberal nation um, if you haven't yet, which was the scenario of, of course, 19th century nationalists, liberal nationalists, or those with whom you have to carry on upholding and sustaining and, 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 and maintaining the justice and, and democracy and democratic quality of the system in a more sort of uh, contemporary setting, uh, i.e. The, the, the setting of, uh, um, of, uh, of liberal nationalists who are mainly and primarily preoccupied with the idea of maintaining that kind of setting rather than creating it to begin with. So I am interested in, in, in solidarity in this sort of more original, not in the sense of innovative, quite the opposite, in the sense of original and restricted way and less moralized way, those with whom you have reason to act together, right? Um, those, those who have to sort out the stuff with you, right? So this is the first then important term. What about transnationalism then? What, how do I understand the term transnational? And here I think I can be a little bit quicker, maybe. Um, there's a little bit less to plow through. I understand transnationalism, I think, in a way that is, I don't think this is controversial when it comes to define it. And yet people keep, I think, using the term transnationalism, transnational and transnationalism much more loosely and almost interchangeably with supranational and cosmopolitan and global. So I want to make clear I'm actually sticking to a very um, sort of orthodox understanding. So I understand trans a phenomenon is transnational if it, if it cuts across borders, but in a way that does not follow neat lines of expanding circles. So it's not about in expanding a circle, right? So there is, there is um, a national movement and then it becomes bigger, but in a, in a clear way that, that follows an expanding logic. No, it cuts across in, in messy ways. So for instance, maybe a, a movement that is transnational includes not all members of a given political community, only some and some members of another political community and so on and so forth, right? So it cuts across borders, but in messy ways, in, in, in ways that do not respect the logic of an expanding niche circle, right? So it's different from cosmopolitan, from supranational, of course, also from um, international, which is a term I didn't have in the handout, and even European, although I am going to make European examples in the last part of the talk, but from a transnational perspective, and I'm, I'm gonna come to that uh, later on, right? Even if you understand European in the neat sense of, a region, a subglobal but supranational region, then again, transnational is not the right term. So examples of this understanding of transnationalism is talking about, for instance, the you know, hipster passion for, for street food as a transnational phenomenon. Of course, it's cuts across borders, but it's only people of, uh, of the privileged middle class and of certain generations that, um, that are part of this transnational phenomenon. Black Lives Matter is a, a transnational political movement. Um, tax competition has important transnational consequences. It affects people um, across borders, but not everybody in the same way, right? Maybe it, it affects people of the same class across borders or people with particularly uh, volatile savings across borders or people who pay more direct than indirect taxes or the other way around across borders. So again, not a clear expanding circle, but much messier than that, right? Usually, again, a lot of people use the term transnationally somewhat, um, I think, um, lightly, right? So use it as just a synonymous for um, for uh, supranational global, you name it, those who actually do use it in the more pointed and focused way um, that, that I'm suggesting is the correct one, 
um, they have sensitivities that go in a very specific uh, direction, right? They recognize the, um, the truly transnational nature of certain political phenomena, of how we affect one another, of how certain dynamics affect people in different jurisdictions, but not everybody, only people of a certain groups in certain jurisdictions, and, and how that overlaps with other transnational phenomena that affect different groups of people. So usually, transnational political sensitivities call for and go along with transnational political solutions, which are by nature complex, multi-leveled, overlapping and interlocking, right? So usually these people want these kind of constructs that actually mirror the transnational nature of certain dynamics. So they, they advocate different types of transnational governance, what transnational really needs to be understood literally here, right? So governance in which there is space for regulating different phenomena in different political fora and across different constituencies, depending on what kind of phenomenon it is, right? So this, there's going to be, so we are going to be citizens of different constituencies in, in, in very different ways, according to the different dynamics that we have. And again, not in a, in a neat way of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a Russian doll sort of, uh, sort of logic, right? So, so it's opposed to a world state, but also opposed to some sort of global federalism, right? So it's really interlocking and overlapping. What is republicanism then? And, uh, and how should I, and how should we understand it? And here um, I'm, I'm doing a slightly different exercise compared to what um, I did in the first, with the first two concepts. So it's not just an exercise of um, conceptual analysis because I think that it is impossible with respect to a theory as opposed to a political concept. Basically what I'm doing is I'm just going to sketch the position that I hold within the Republican debate and within the Republican um, intervention in the global justice debate in particular. Uh, so, so sketch it because it's work that I've done in the past and because there's, there's no space of doing anything more than sketching it here. So I hope I give you a good enough idea of why I find it plausible, but it's not more than sketching because what I actually want to go to today is to say, given that we have these commitments, what sort of solidarity should we push for? This is what I ultimately want to do. So bear with me. But of course, if you have questions about the position to begin with, you know, that's fair enough. Of course, it's absolutely fair enough. So republicanism means um, different things to different people. Uh, I'm here at the top of page two. I shall, I shall understand it primarily as a theory of justice, as opposed to a conception of freedom, which is the way in which is more traditionally understood, although some people today defend it as a theory of justice, starting from Frank Lovett, among many others. Not many, maybe, but a few others. So, um, so being a Republican doesn't mean understanding freedom in a certain way and not in another way, in a Republican as opposed to, say, liberal way, but to me means saying that that demand, the demand to be free in that way in which Republicans mean, i.e. the demand to be non-dominated is the primary claim of justice, right? So the first most fundamental claim of justice that you have is a demand to enjoy protection against domination, is to be free in that robust way, to not be at the mercy of others. That's the, the fundamental um, claim of justice that you have, and everyone is entitled to it. So in this very minimal sense, uh, there is a cosmopolitan core. Um, so this is how I understand it. And, and, and then the specific substantive theory that I defend is one according to which the best protection against non-domination, against domination, is ensured when people live in republics, i.e. in political entity with a republican constitution and setting. Right, so uh, certain rights are protected robustly, but also where people actually can participate democratically to actually have a say in the kind of laws that apply to them, whilst I however being sure that they are protected against sort of tyranny of the majorities like phenomena, right? So a democratic system with constitutional constraints of some form, right? So when they live in republics, when they live in political 
in political um, entities of this kind, right? Whose fate they can steer, right? So this is this is when they can they, they enjoy best protection, right? Hence, a world divided in subglobal communities overall preferable, right? A world in in divided in entities that are small enough that that kind of phenomenon can actually happen, right? That they're not so big that they cannot be controlled in that way. And also where people have enough of a feeling of common demos so that it can happen, right? So in principle, this is not about saying, I, 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 I believe in the national state system as it is, but it is as long as it can do that job, I am fine with it. The as long is, is, is a little bit more complicated, so we can talk about the um, the uh, the qualifications to that. There is that there must be quite a bit of flexibility for redrawing the boundaries if there are enough calls for it, right? So secessions, changes of uh, of borders, and so on and so forth. But it's fine to start more or less with the system that we have, right? Within that. The claim not to be dominated is indeed held against everybody else, but the claim to be maximally protected against domination in this way. So the claim you know, to be in a republic and for that republic to do um, a really, really good job uh, is held against those um, who share that institutional setting with me. Right? So I have a duty not to dominate outsiders and to fight, to fight against any domination to whom I can uh, contribute um, uh, transnationally, right? And that includes things that I don't do necessarily voluntarily, right? Because domination is basically a standing, right? Sometimes I find myself having the power to dominate others simply because of how the global market has been construed. And I haven't done anything about it, right? It's not something that I've done, right? A duty not to dominate others, you know, you really have to take that very literally, it's not a duty not to coerce others, not to boss other people around. It's a duty to make sure that, of course, I don't use that power if I have it, but if I have it, to recognize that it's wrong for me to have it, so to work towards a system in which that is no longer the case. So it is quite demanding, right? Because it basically says the moment in which I am in such a position, something needs to be changed, right? But of course, allows for a lot of diversity, right? So um, the latter duty is likely to have different concrete implications towards different groups of people, right? Especially from a point of view of what you, people usually and most often call justice in, in sort of the liberal distributive justice debate, it's compatible with different principles of distributive justice holding in different settings, right? That's not the issue because principles of distributive justice, so how much people should have with respect to one another, in this understanding is basically an implication of whatever it takes to make sure that non-domination applies. So it's derivative, first of all, and it's likely to be different in different settings, right? However, and this is the catch, and with this we arrive to basically the final claim of today, the catch is those republics in which we have to live to enjoy this kind of maximal non-domination must themselves not do, be no, dominated. It's the basically is the, is the Quentin Skinner idea that domination requires being a free person in a free state or in a free polity, if you don't want to use just the word state, right? And it matters that the polity be itself free. Right? And that requires a whole series of trans and supranational assurances and regulations, right? To make sure that the Republic really is free. And ensuring those is part of a global Republican theory of justice. Right? Making sure that those republics are really free. And free means protected robustly, protected in a Republican, non-dominated way. So across different possible different uh, possible worlds and not just here and now from from global and transnational dynamics that expose these republics to domination so what that does that mean it means that there is a fundamental sense in which demands of justice uh, for republicans um, are cosmopolitan right and if I somehow contribute to your domination, even if simply by finding myself in a position of dominating power without having done anything about it, 
I have a binding duty to stop that. And this, the binding duty to stop that should be understood in a broadly speaking, I call it Poggian sense. So it's a negative duty. I have a duty to stop the domination, but it might require a lot of positive action. But beyond that, um, things become trickier and much more uh, uh, differentiated, right? Um, so the issue is the questions that we might ask are, for instance, have I got a duty to stop your domination by third parties? And that's something on which I don't say anything today. But also uh, in terms, and as I've said, in terms of liberal distributive justice, making sure that others, outsiders that I might affect are not dominated might require very different principles. So there's a lot of diversity um, allowed in that. Um, uh, in that, and it needs not translate into a juridical, uh, political cosmopolitan project. So why, um, so why then, if we, if we, if we, if we, if we, if it's not that, right? If it's not a cosmopolitan project, is what we need is is people living in republics and those republics need to be small enough and cohesive enough they basically need whatever it takes to get going from that point of view um so so we need a, a, a diversity of sovereign jurisdictions and entities but we also need to have um uh, to have protections against uh, global dynamics it should be clear why this position is not naively statist it should be clear why it's not naively cosmopolitan, but, and this is basically the puzzle, why should it not be um, transnational, right? Why should it not be one in which we basically pay attention to all the overlapping ways in which we can dominate one another and set in place different kinds of institutions to protect that in a very sort of interlocking way? Well, for the very same reason why we don't want a big state, but differently construed, right? Because what we need for the sort of robust domination that, that you can have within a republic is an ongoing vigilant citizenry that is aware of the issues at stake, that has enough of a stake and enough of a motivation to get going, but also that is not going to, um, well, it's not necessary for people to basically spend the entire of their time thinking about that, right? So my claim is that this is incompatible, not only as most Republicans would say, with a full-blown cosmopolitan perspective, but also with an overly complicated um, uh, transnational governance scenario, right? Basically what I'm saying is you need to sort out priorities if you are a Republican of this kind. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to be clear about the fact that yes, things are complicated and you can dominate others, but you need a focus. There needs to be one main area of allegiance and civic engagement. Right. Um, one area in which we say, OK, we are in this together and in being in this together, we try to protect ourselves from transnational threats and try to protect others who are in their own republics from common threats or threats that even we impose on them. But the main action is here. The main action is within republics. So we are serious about how free stated is threatened by many transnational dynamics, but it's free stated that we mainly care about. We are not, we are not cosmopolitans, but we are also not transnationalists who want to basically de facto in a sort of cubist sort of way, deconstruct the state in all these multiple and innumerable different jurisdictions where at the end of the day, you get lost. Right, So you will have some supranational regulation and some institutional building, but it will not be that sort of complicated, interlocking, constantly open-ended transnational governance. It will be the amount, all that it takes, but only all that it takes to protect um, free statehood. So what that, does that mean for transnational Republican solidarity then? Um, so let me start with uh, an empirical datum. It's not, um, I, I'm not interested in it only because it's an empirical datum, although to some extent as well, 
uh, but but because it basically inadvertently offers a metaphor that I think is very useful. Um, I know that I, I don't think he's here, but I think Carlo Burrelli is also in your department. Um, if yeah, I am traveling today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't really matter. It's just that if you were here, I would have said actually uh, he has been using um, he's been using this this data um, in a recent co-authored. Um, article with Maurizio Ferreira. And it's basically the data of a survey saying, asking EU citizens to choose a metaphor which they saw as the most apt for fellow feelings across borders within the European Union. So do Europeans see themselves as part of a common home, of an apartment building, where they have basically basic rules and, uh, and basic structure that they need to take care of, but then they're all in different homes. Of a courtyard to which you can, you know, you can go down to and interact with others, but you can also go back to your home and, and forget about it if you want to, or even a sinking ship, right? And they said, I mean, of course, this is overly simply, simplified. They didn't all say the same thing. And of course, answers change from country to country, but by and large, there was a clear, majority for the metaphor of the apartment building. And now both the people who run the survey and Burelli and, and Ferreira use this to show actually there are feelings of solidarity within the European Union, and that's fine and that is useful to me as well. Um, but the main take home lesson for me is, is really how useful the metaphor of the, um, um, of the apartment building is I think surprisingly congenial with the, with the idea of, uh, uh, of solidarity that I think we should aim for in transnational settings. And the sort of picture that I've, that I've just given to you in the sketch of the account of, of, of justice without, uh, beyond borders that, that I defend. So the idea of an apartment building is we have different homes, but these homes like different demoi are importantly interdependent. And if certain um, structural, certain rules, but also certain structural features, you know, the foundations of the house, the heating, whatever, are not sorted, then we can't properly live well in our homes. So it's about sorting out the building so that we can go back and live in our homes um, freely. And, and possibly also, uh, so, so this, this really this idea of we are in it together, but we are in it together, not because we have a common home, we are in it together, because there are certain issues that we can, we must solve together, in order to then go back and do what we really care to do in our common homes. So I think this is a really good metaphor for the kind of thing that I've told you about just a few minutes ago, we are in it together as Republicans want to live in healthy republics, because we have there are certain transnational dynamics that need to be sorted out for us to be able to live in those dynamics, to, to live in those republics. Certain features of the global market that hollow out our democracies, certain features of the global market that make it impossible for us to have stable fiscal systems or, 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 or stable currencies and so on and so forth but we are in it together so that we can go back and decide what to do in our political homes. That's the sort of image. And then when we are in these homes, um, then there might be other, you know, transnational interlocking complicating things of a different area as well, right? So I might have a separate dispute with the specific apartment just above me for some leakage, or there might be certain form of solidarity of conflicts between families with children and, family and, and, and people without small children in the apartment block, right? But when the big scaffolding is in order, it becomes easier to actually sort out these things on an ad hoc basis because the big things are in order. And again, in the comparison with the international arena, you might say, when these basic transnational dynamics are sorted, then maybe these more specific issues can be dealt with in a traditional intergovernmental way, because the framing is offered, right? So this is, I think, not an overwhelming cluster of demands, because it gives a sense of priorities, right? Um, it gives us reasons to stand in solidarity with outsiders, 
that share our plight. And our plight is our republics or our would-be republics are in danger. We cannot control our, our fate in the individual political communities that we want to be part of but not because we want to create a common home. So we share something together, but that what, which, the thing which we share is a, is a desire to go back to our homes and, and, and do things in, and, and have free homes, free political homes. So it's not just about um, an issue of expanding the circle of solidarity in a cosmopolitan way, um, but it is not also about multiplying types of solidarity in an innumerable and never ending complicated transnational way like transnational governance folks would want to do it. And basically, and here this, I, I really come to a conclusion. Um, if you really want to have an example of that, I think you have to go back to liberal nationalists, but um, to 19th century ones again, again and not um, 20th uh, and 21st century ones. So with those who were actually in the process of creating nations where nations were still a progressive rather than a partly conservative endeavor. So fundamentally, re European Republican patriots in the 19th century, right? They had a common enemy, the Ancien Regime, right? That if this was, as long as this was in power, the Ancien Regime, the idea of, of uh, a group of dynastic royal families in Europe basically deciding the fates of all different areas of Europe and, and deciding it via marriages and alliances, unless this system was really taken down, they couldn't actually um, uphold and put forward and advance their desire to create republics or even, you know, maybe constitutional monarchies, but anyway, something fundamentally different from the Ancien Regime. But they also were keenly aware um, that they had to stand in solidarity with one another to do that. So there was a lot of networking among patriots in exile, a lot of sharing of tactics and strategies. There was a lot of that going on. Um, but there was also a keen awareness that the aim was not to create a common home, right? With the exception perhaps of, of Mazzini, who wanted to create um, a Republican Europe, the aim was to create, well, by and large, if you allow me the sort of cavalier statement, the Europe that, um, that, um, that we have now. So one with the, with the republics um, in place, right? So they wanted to destroy a common enemy, not to create something else together. Right, or the together was only limited. The something else that they wanted to create was a was a scenario in which they could each build a national republic. Right, it was not the aim was not to create a common home. In a way, this was is exactly what was happening um, from the very beginning, actually, of uh, of the fight against the Ancien Regime. Right, if you think about the idea of exporting the revolution in the second phase of the French Revolution, it wasn't necessarily a globalist project. It was an, as a project of helping others do the same thing, namely take down their own monarchic families, but not necessarily creating um, a European Republic, right? So mutatis mutandis, I think um, this is exactly the idea to basically ask yourself, do you want a Republican democracy still worth the name, not a hollow one? Um, where all decisions have basically been taken elsewhere by due to these transnational dynamics. And of course, we have to agree about what these are, right? And I'm, I haven't said anything about that today. What are these? Uh, we have to agree on a set of priorities, which are the things that we want to tackle first. Do we want to uh, tackle global mobility? Uh, sorry, global capital mobility. Do we want to tackle financial volatility? Do we want to um, do we want to tackle currency volatility? But let's agree on the priorities. But the idea is those things um, that um, that make it possible for you to regain that then that democratic and republican quality within. Um, your own jurisdiction, right? This can happen via the traditional party system, right? It's not something that requires the creation of new transnational movements. It can acquire, it can just require the traditional party system to adopt a different logic, namely to not just say, this is the kind of thing that I'm going to deliver, but vote for me 
And I am going to coordinate, I'm actually already coordinating with all cynically minded political parties across Europe to actually put these things on the agenda of the European Union and of the single European countries and member states of the European Union. So showing that there is this concerted agenda and even within everyday party political life, this can happen, right? Hosting one another at, at, at party conferences, exchanging ideas, having, having almost partially common manifestos, really this idea, these are the things that we have to fight together so that we can go back to, um, to something um, uh, similar at home. Um, and I think this is something that demands a little bit more complexity, but not a kind of complexity that people cannot handle, right? Um, because it gives them a clear purpose, a clear hand point, rather than, than leaving them with this idea of, you know, there's, oh my God, I can influence people and dominate people in so many different ways, where do I even start? And I sort of end in a somewhat uh, tongue-in-cheek way by saying, um, maybe progressives haven't really managed to get that off the ground quite yet. There were some attempts between progressive parties in the 2012 sovereign crisis, but funnily enough, uh, the political parties that have been quite successful in that regard are right-wing sovereignist populists, which in spite of actually being deeply Eurosceptics, have actually managed uh, a great deal of coordination and an exchange of ideas among themselves, and and that's exactly the kind of uh, that's exactly the kind of of, uh, of of thinking and of of strategy of solidarity. And they have themselves used the language of solidarity to express that, right? Because they 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 express it as, as a, they use the terminology of let's let's get our democracies um, uh, back, right? So we have a common idea of getting our democracies back. So this, I think, can work, and and the fact that it can work, I mean, all sorts of all sorts of qualifications that you're going to ask me about. But the fact that it can work is, I think, uh, supported by the fact that it seems to work for those who actually, um, at face value, have the kind of ideology that is most inimical to any idea of transnational solidarity. Thank you. Thanks so much, Miriam, for this very interesting and um, rich, rich talk, um, which I found very compelling. I would suggest that we now go back and forth between um, questions from in-person people here in the classroom and persons online. Um, those who are online and have a question, please um, raise your hand or say so in the chat. Just write in the chat, I have a question. Um, and then you'll be ask to um, share that question. Um, is there anyone here in the room who would like to raise a question for Miriam after Steve has asked his question? So Steve was first, um, and then we move to a question from the room, if there is, if there is one, and then move back to a question from the online audience. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Miriam. Can you hear me? Um, yes, and, very well. uh, yes, and I have I have two preliminary uh, points. Um, one is uh, thank you for being willing to sort of share this work in progress because I could not agree more that thinking through uh, questions with an audience is is in is in many cases much more valuable than presenting a kind of absolutely finished and tidy uh, project and uh, actually having a chance to exchange ideas is, is very exciting. And the second is that one of the other, there are many unfortunate parts of, of Zoom, et cetera, but one of the nice parts is that we get to see uh, various things. And I see you have a, a whole series of wine bottles behind you. And I would like to know, uh, since you hopefully will be coming to Paris in April, I would like to know uh, what you, which are your favorites. I happen to be um, relatively interested in such questions as well, along with uh, political theory. So we will, <laughs> we will, uh, we will, we will maintain solidarity in in multiple ways. Um, and there were a couple of bottles I had a specific question about, but I'll keep my questions uh, directly on, on your topic here. 
uh, which again, I found fascinating. And I had many questions as you went through, but I think I will zero in on the last point you made partially because any attempt to go back to the 19th century for answers is, is particularly dear to my heart, but also because I think it raises and, and uh, slightly less polemically than your very last point, which, uh, which I think uh, about the, the, um, the nationalists um, and uh, populists, which, um, which I'd have more to say about, but I'd just like to focus on the 19th century question and as you said, so there, as I understand you, you said, well, one of the places we could go back to would be early 19th century liberal nationalists, uh, to some extent Mazzini, but there are many, of course, in France, certainly in Germany, uh, the young Hegelians going to Paris, et cetera, precisely looking to be inspired by France to create a new German nationalism, but that will then help um, lead a new age of, uh, of sort of um, of a multinational democratic identity, uh, perhaps best captured by the Franco-German annals that Marx and Ruge are, are, were putting together in 1843 uh, in Paris, for example. Um, and they certainly were trying to create nations and they did have as a common enemy, the old regime. Um, and one thing I would like to suggest that, that uh, works in that direction is that um, there is also a sense in which early 19th century, let's say first half of the 19th century Republicans in France, and to some extent uh, in Germany and in, and in Italy, were partially also interested in sort of taking back control after what they considered to have been the sort of negative effects of globalization that, uh, that had prevented the French Revolution from achieve, achieving its aims. And for some of them had even contributed to the terror. Um, and so there is, there, there is a real parallel there. However, there are two major critiques of that because of course the story doesn't end in the mid 19th century, it continues. And on the one hand, of course, we have the critique of um, a kind of you know, classic socialist or, or Marxist critique, which is born at the same time, which is to say, but the problem is that the nation is domination. That, that, this, that this truly is the problem, that the, that the nation is a bourgeois entity and that it is ultimately in the service of those who dominate. And the whole problem is precisely figuring out a social form that allows us to overcome this form of domination. But the other critique that's going to emerge is the critique that's going, and the term that's used in France makes this particularly interesting for your talk, which is solidarisme. So le solidarisme, as it develops in France in the 18, let's say between the 1890s and 1920s, um, which is usually sided with the new liberalism in Britain or with progressivism in the United States is precisely designed to overcome the limits of this kind of early nationalism that develops in the first part of the 19th century, precisely because what they argue is they say, you know, in the end, Marx was at least, or at least socialist critiques are at least partially right. That is, that there is a way in which the nation, when we put it forward, overwhelmingly has a tendency to become in itself a form of domination. And at the core of what they try to do then is to push forward essentially large scale regulation. And their great critique of mid 19th century nationalists is that they couldn't scale up complex modes of regulation to the level of a large nation, which is exactly what is ultimately achieved, let's say with the birth of the modern administrative state between 1880 and 1920. And I guess my one concern then, so just to get to this very specific question that would come out of this, is that you, you kept sort of referring to the problem of complexity and that this would be overly complex, et cetera. But it seems to me that in many ways in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, when these early uh, nationalists are trying to think about just unifying a nation, 
The idea that you would have modes of regulatory power that would operate at the scale of France or at the scale of the United States or at the scale of an empire was just unthinkable. And by 1890, 1900, it is entirely doable. And by 1920, you have basically most of the forms of modern regulatory power that we that we then try to destroy after, let's say, the 1960s, 1970s. Right, um, but I guess the what's that? Uh, please, please come to an end so we have space for the other questions then. Still. Yeah. So the point is precisely this: that so is it not possible that this what strikes us as tremendously complex is actually um, an, a, a sort of certain lack of imagination about how we could actually regulate um, at a larger scale, that is at a global scale, and that wouldn't be sort of an impossibility. Thank you, Steve. And, sorry. Miriam? Um, thank you, Steve. And actually, uh, you know, thanks for the, I, I'm sorry, I'm saying this in a tongue in cheek way, but really in a good spirit. Thanks for the mini lecture, because it's exactly <laughs> what I need. It, it sounds like I really need to uh, do some reading about uh, solidarism. Um, because it sounds like, uh, like it's precisely the kind of stuff that I have in mind. Uh, so, but let me uh, not quite answer the question, but basically may, mainly clarify two things, uh, which I think might um, provide some support as to why I'm still worried about complexity and why, you know, why I position myself in, in, a, in a position of constant opposition between Marxist intuitions and traditional 19th century Republican intuitions. And that is basically, you know, that I see, <laughs> that I see these things, I, I see them as both saying one side of the truth. And so I, I see our best job as a Republican to try and find the best balance for the time being whilst being aware that it might constantly um, escape us. So yes, of course, the kind of republics then then uh, um, were built was inherently bourgeois entities, even more so than the ones which, you know, were still called bourgeois by most Marxists that were built after World War II, because they, by and large, didn't have welfare states, by and large, didn't have that kind of complex regulation that the states which still most Marxists would call bourgeois that came out of, uh, of, uh, of the, you know, 30 years after World War II still had, right? So that is absolutely true. But as a Republican, um, I think we are, as a sort of, let, let's say, left-leaning Republican, as a progressive Republican, I think that's the problem. The dangers of domination are multifarious. So we have to, um, uh, and, and the, the sort of, of work that I do, for instance, in global institutional building with, with republicanism, exactly to say that we have, you know, we have to take care of different things at the same time. And the more we tend to go one way, the more we leave a hole in the place that we have left, right? So yes, um, if, uh, if we retreat too much, uh, to uh, if we are if we are not sufficiently ambitious, both from the point of view of the kind of things that we want to glo re regulate globally, and also how much that is possible, but also uh, how much how much is possible from the point of view of depth rather than rather than extension. So how you know uh, how left we can move. We forgot all we forget all sorts of sources of domination. That is true, right? But um, uh, but as a Republican, I say that kind of broadly speaking Marxist critique of uh, the bourgeois state is correct. As a Republican, I think there's all sorts of way in which I can criticize pretty much all sorts of real life incarnation of, uh, of real life socialism for having deep flaws from a Republican point of view, including the fact of uh, de facto um, disallowing political control and the possibility of dissent. So the kind of beast that I want to create is a beast that creates the best compromise between, uh, between these. So, so the metaphor is very limited there in that, of course, I don't have, I don't have 19th century um, 
republics in mind, right? Let alone at least at least in um, at least in, in 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 Germany there was a very early instantiation of the welfare state, although not within a republic. But definitely, I don't have those in mind. But so the metaphor was only limited to say you can. You can be animated by by the idea of killing a common enemy, right? A common tyrant, but not necessarily with the idea of then creating something together, right? So, um, so it it's, it sounds like this solidarism is something that I should read more about because it sounds like there are a lot of insights about the direction that I want to go. Um, but um, but just to say why. Um, why I want to stick to my guns in terms of complexity. Um, let me say two things that maybe I didn't clarify because in a way the theoretical apparatus was just a sketch. So first of all, I am not skeptical about the possibility of uh, really quite effective global regulation, right? That's not the worry that I have, that it's too complex from that point of view is too much, right? When it comes to regulating too much at the global level, right, that my worry is not one of complexity. My worry of complexity is against the transnationalists. So let me address this in, 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 in turn. My worry with, the, with devolving too much upwards is one of democratic and republican subsidiarity. I am, I am sure that we can sort out a lot of stuff. But I am very skeptical that this kind of regulation can be controlled democratically and can really escape technocratic capture. So my worry there is a very traditional Republican one for, 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 the, for abiding to the principle of subsidiarity as much as possible is not one of complexity. I am sure that if we say, okay, we, we, we deal with this by, by, by simply creating a global entity and we let most things to be decided by the global entity and this you know, can be a placeholder for whatever global phenomenon you think is important, this can be done. So my worry there is mainly democratic. The complexity, and I don't think that here historical examples can really help, is really with the transnationalists in particular. So those who want to say, it's all sorts of different things and we need to create a multiplicity of different fora to address some of those. And even if we don't even need to crystallize all these different fora because who is in which can change all the time, right? So I really mean transnational governance in the, in the very specific sense of people who actually think you have all these, all these kinds of different allegiances and different problems that you have to solve with different people. So there are certain issues that are European, some issues that pertain to you being a member of a certain class, some issues that pertain to you being a member of another important and salient different groups. And, and these things can mutate all the time. And so my worry of complexity there, again, to simplify things that are difficult, is more the traditional Oscar Wilde. The problem with socialism is that it takes too many evenings. I want something that motivates people by taking enough evenings, so getting people back to repoliticization, but but not to to a kind that they will find overwhelming. Great, thank you very much, Miriam. And we will now take a question here from the audience. Um, Gideon, you have a question? Uh, without a Without a world state to determine the uh, obligations of states to diminish their own power, uh, what what coercion would exist between these states to ensure like, to prevent a freeloader problem from states not cooperating but still benefiting from the, that cooperation? Sorry, you're, 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 muted. Muted. We can't you're muted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I keep, maybe I should just not mute myself at all while you speak. <laughs> Um, thanks a lot. So I think it all boils down to what you call state. Uh, I have a pretty robust understanding of it. So I don't think, yes, I do think that you will need that some of these forms of global regulations will have to be binding and enforceable and that you will have to create a global entity for it. I think it takes a long time before you call this a global state. And I think it takes a slightly less long time, but still a long time before you call this even a form of global federation. So I think, um, I think it's, yes, it's true. You would have some of this. I think it would be 
all that it takes to solve the problems for the different Republican homes, but only all that it takes. So I think at the end of the day, it would be quite limited. So I wouldn't call it states. And I think there are mechanisms for, um, um, so, so, so yes, so basically the short answer is yes, of course, if you wanna say that there would be a very, very thin global state, you can say it. I think it's mainly terminological, but I think I prefer a terminology that says, um, it's not. It's not. It's not the. It's not the terrain in which the most important political battles would be fought. Uh, so, and, and it's not a terrain that would have a constitutive, a constituent power in the way, um, in in the way that we actually give to states, right? And it's a, and 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 it would be a regulatory framework with binding force. But there are so many things that it wouldn't have that even the European Union, for instance, has. Right. And the other one is, and I haven't done much thinking about this at all, admittedly, and it's shameful because I really should have by now, is there are all different ways about all different. Um, how can I say this? I think a lot is going to depend on how exactly this global entity is going to be formed and how it's going to be democratically controlled, right? Whether it's going to be democratically controlled intergovernmentally mainly or in, or in slightly different ways. So I think there are certain compositions that are a little bit more democratic, if you pass me the, ter the terms, so that put these global entities under the control, not just of the governments of the states that compose it, but of the peoples of these governments that still would make most of the decisions taken by this global entity, the concerted decision of different of the different parliaments of the different republics that compose it so would tone down even further the extent to which this is a separate global thin state okay is there anyone else from the online um audience that would like to think the ask measures? a question um yeah perhaps it is time on of course <laughs> Yeah, Dimitris. Right, so Miriam, thanks a lot for the paper. Hi, Dimitris. Um, hi there. So here's, here's basically where I'm a bit confused. So you asked the questions, how should we conceive um, Republican transnational solidarity? And I think your reply seems to be, we should think it in terms of uh, intergovernmental Republican solidarity. That's the kind of thing of answer that you give. So I was confused about this section of on transnationalism. Maybe, maybe you should. Maybe, maybe the differences is between inter the intergovernmental approach and transnational approach should become clearer than discussed. Maybe that's in, in that part of the paper. Um, the other point that I have is maybe maybe can frame in terms of this um, of this idea of this picture of the apartment block. Um, there are certain cases, as you mentioned, where, for example, we can coordinate our actions in the apartment block. We can agree, for example, on the charges for you know, fast internet or on the kind of cables that we can use to charge our devices or our sockets, for example. But it seems to me that some decisions inevitably involved how big our apartments will be in relation to other apartments, because you know, the apartment block is a limited space, as well as where exactly our apartment is going to be higher up maybe on the highest floor or you know on the lower maybe floor so these kind of decisions require if you like some kind of concessions from some parts from some let's say owners of the apartments vis-a-vis -vis others and therefore coordination or intergovernmental coordination becomes more difficult because it involves trade-offs so and also it involves obviously some losing with respect to others as opposed to all gaining from such transactions. So it seems to me that coordination of that sort is more difficult and this is where the action is with, with respect to um, liberal nationalists as well as even right-wing populists. They just appeal not to some form of solidarity, this is perhaps where I disagree with you, um, but mainly to a sense of enlightened self-interest and national interest of a sort that seems to me to be more related to a strict notion of, you know, 
my country first, national interest comes first before other considerations. So I can't see really how this can be hijacked by Republicans and turn around if in such conditions, the national interest of one country is pitched and is actually, um, let's say, completely antithetical to the national interest of another country. Thanks, Dimitri. So I think you've asked me many things and I'm not sure that I managed to um, uh, take note of all of them. Um, so I, I wasn't sure as to why you think that mine is actually intergovernmental solidarity rather than transnational. Maybe you can uh, hold that thought. Maybe you can uh, have another go. I'd be grateful if you had another go. Um, so let me, you know, let me answer the, the, the last bit first because it's the one that stuck most for obvious psychological reasons. Um, so I'm not denying that there are cases in which, uh, of course, my national interest is directly pitched against yours, right? And in that case, I think on the basis of the way in which I, you know, I, 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 I I, I, I conceptualize solidarity in, in the first part of the paper and on paper. Um, other forms of solidarity or something that is not solidarity, that is simply a duty of justice will come in place, right? So I am not suggesting um, we can have our cake and eat it. And actually everything can be solved by looking at the fact that we don't have conflicting interests we only have a common enemy, uh, which is pitching us against each other. And at the moment in which we have a gestalt um, switch, we can actually realize that. Mm. I am saying that in a limited way. I, I am saying there are quite a few things that are like that. And those few things, and those things I, I think are quite central, can be mobilized within a system in which both our um, ordinary forms of political activism and the institutions and organs that we have for political power, namely by and large um, for political action, sorry, not power, namely parties can be kept more or less as they are or in the broad lines as much as they are. So let us concentrate on those. So I'm not denying that there will be cases in which, of course, right? <laughs> uh, you know, of course there are cases that are um, much more like, um, if you if you allow me the very sort of uh, broad brushed analogy, there are cases that are much more like colonialism and much less like, uh, oh, we are all under the power of global capital. And if we only re realized it, then we would realize that we actually not, but yes, there are so many cases in which we are pitched against each other because as long as we keep looking at the issue from the point of view of what I can currently do without coordinating with you, then our interests are in conflict, but they no longer are if we use the traditional means. So traditional party politics and traditional national politics to coordinate with others there's a lot that we can do in that respect. So that's, that, that is the only thing that I'm suggesting. And yes, that thing is solidarity. And I think it's solidarity that very much has the flavor of, um, of um, enlightened self-interest. Indeed, I said so myself. I said, I said that there is a very long standing tradition that understands solidarity as mainly self enlightened self-interest. So I stand in solidarity not with those for whom I feel sorry, for whatever reasons, uh, but with those who are suffering the same, the same thing that I am suffering, and crucially, those with whom I need to act together in order to end our common flight. flight. So yes, I think um, I am unapologetic about the fact that I think there is a fundamental root of enlightened self-interest in a lot of the most original understanding of solidarity. And I think there's a lot that we can mobilize by by going back to that, we're not going to solve all problems, but I think we can we, we can solve quite a few in that respect. Is there time to have another go at the difference between nationalism and uh, intergovernmental? Can you give it the, the intergovernmental point? Yeah. 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 Very quickly, please. 
Right. So basically, think of an example of uh, a union or unions in Europe. So unions in Europe, let's say they can you mean lobby trade the, unions. Trade, trade unions. Yeah, trade unions, for example, can lobby the government so as to coordinate at the European level to have some kind of coordination of, uh, for example, working time. But it is possible that that very goal might be best served by a European Union that has its headquarters in Brussels and that coordinates top-down such industrial action so as to prioritize, for example, its resources in a way that will maximize the possible effect in favor of those most vulnerable, in, in favor, in other words, of those who work longest hours within the European context. So it seems to me that assuming that always this more, if you like, decentralized or more intergovernmental approach in coordinating solidarity across borders will be the most effective way um, is not simply practically true. I mean, okay. there could be cases where what I describe at least as a more transnational and even more don't maybe top-down approach might be more effective in minimizing, let's say, the most um, extreme cases of domination, of social domination, as opposed to the kind of more intergovernmental approach that you seem to to favor. But again, I might be wrong in what exactly you mean here by the mm -hmm. intergovernmental approach. Yeah. Uh, but so, this is so, a way to, to put it in, in terms of an example, at least. No, no, no. I think I understood better now. Mm -hmm. But I think then it was a, you were making a substantive point and not just. A, so, well, first of all, I think I, I want to resist the label intergovernmental, if at all. And I know I am, again, putting more stuff that is not in the paper and that is come, yeah, but such is life. <laughs> Especially when you are old and, and have been around for a while, <laughs> you have you have uh, put yourself in many in, in quite a few debates. But I think I would call this more democratic than intergovernmentalist. So it's not about it, it, intergovernmentalism is and exactly you've made an example that is not about governments coming together. Is about trade unions, national trade unions coming together, um, whilst at the time keeping a channel open both upwards and with their own constituencies inside. So it's workers coming together, but as demos of workers. So not the workers of Europe, but the different communities of European workers. And I think the same is true for other more traditional democratic examples, right? So I would call that democratic rather than, than intergovernmentalism because it's not governments, it's the, the different demoi. And I think that makes a huge difference. Second, I'm, I definitely am not advocating that this is, um, yeah, you, you probably disagree, but I think there's a <laughs> really big, big difference between the democracy and intergovernmentalism. But um, I'm not advocating that it's the most efficient uh, although it depends on what you mean by efficiency. Uh, if you mean efficiency in the short run or at face value, yeah, probably there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of inefficiencies in the system and also there's a lot, of, a, a lot of what might be achieved might look suboptimal. But as a Republican, I am concerned with other things as well. I am concerned about regulatory and technocratic capture. I am concerned about genuine democratic control. So, I am, um, so I basically think that as Republicans, given the multifarious nature of uh, the potential for power to become dominated, as I, as I was answering to Steve, we are in the constant um, business, not of finding the most efficient solution, but what strikes us as, as, as the best and, and most balanced compromise. So that to me, the kind of idea that I was suggesting to you for if for me the, the best compromise between efficiency, getting some of these things solved, maybe not all of them in the way in which we would with a global republic, with a world republic or a European republic, but getting some and the most pressing ones while at the same time not sacrificing channels of real political accountability that as a Republican in an old school, Kantian, if you want, uh, sense, I, I think are uh, very, very likely to fall prey to technocratic capture. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another five or six minutes and uh, there's room for at least uh, one more question by Daisy um, yeah. and maybe for a second question as well. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, how would you say that um, you could like bridge this fine line of populism? Because I mean, going back to the comments. I'm sorry. Is that is there maybe a microphone, or could you get closer? Could you maybe Desi, Could you get closer to the laptop because I can't hear you very well. Can you hear me now? Yes. Well, let's try. Or maybe can you can you come a little bit closer to um to the left of the. <laughs> Do you hear me now? I think so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, how would you bridge the fine line of populism? Because um, Gorbachev, you know, he gave the address with the common European home based on like security structures, and it seems like even then, with, a, with my class three professor Newton, it sets up the other. There always has to be somebody we have to be against because we're in solidarity with each other because there's always an enemy to fight. Does it, isn't that divisive in it, in of its structure? Do you understand what I'm saying? Like how do you bridge that fine line that it could get divisive where there always has to be an enemy? There's always somebody we have to challenge or fight against even though in reality it might not be so. Can you tell me why you think that in, thank you. Um, thank you very much. I, I guess, um, I think it's, I guess I, I guess I wonder whether there is a plausible reconstruction where it is not so in this case, as in, um, uh, okay, ne um, I mean, neoliberalism is clearly the ancien regime of the 21st century. <laughs> So it is there. Why shouldn't we name it if it if it if it very much exists? So, but maybe but maybe you're worried. Yeah, can you tell me okay, um, what, what your worry is a bit more specifically? That sometimes okay. we might be obsessed with. Okay, um, okay, so I remember in a class with um, Professor Newton, she talked about how you know post Cold War and how. Europe was supposed to be structured. And Gorbachev wanted a common European home based on solidarity within like security structures, but that was rejected because there were already Western institutions who wanted to band together and create the Europe that they wanted before the Cold War. And in that case, Russia, Russia had to be set up as the other, it had to be set up, okay, we're together in our liberalist values, so we always have to fight against communism, or we always have to fight against anti western values and because we're in solidarity with each other based on our values so it's, it looks like and you said somewhere here that uh that populist um leaders are using this because they always effectively um paint this enemy that people have to act together to combat instead of instead of uniting people it's such it's just like structurally divisive there always has to be that enemy how do you breach that breach that line hmm. Yeah, again, I'm not sure that I've understood um, the point entirely, but um, is the idea, so first of all, so the analogy with populists was limited, right, was, was a very tongue-in-cheek remark to basically say if they manage to actually be pretty good at transnational coordination and solidarity, surely we can, right, so it was meant really in this way that they, they can actually and they use the same uh, the, the same sort of logic. Um, uh, I guess I am not denying the possibility. I mean, I I think I am a Republican of a fairly realist variety, so I find it difficult to imagine a scenario in which there isn't one, right? But if what you like an enemy, but if you're saying you know we we need to construct it. In, this, in the way in which Western Europe constructed the Soviet Union as, as, as an enemy. No, I'm not necessarily suggesting that this is necessary, that this is part of a necessary narrative, right? It can also be, and, and also it doesn't have to have this, it doesn't need to be an enemy in a personal sense, not even, not even loosely conceived, right? Another, another agent, the, the Eastern Bloc, right? The enemy can be exactly it can be neoliberalism, or it can be climate change. I think climate change can even be a very a very good example. So there is this. So I think it's better to call it a problem, maybe more than an enemy. But yes, yeah, I, I think, think the right wing sovereignist populist already playing this game. 
already claimed already playing this game on page number four yes so yes so in that sense of uh you know that thing where it could be a problem but it also could also be identifying enemies and just trying to like work against them okay so maybe let's put it let's put it this way and maybe maybe this manages to get down to what the disagreement is so because i have argued that um uh that this kind of understanding of republican justice has nothing that is inherently um cosmopolitan right so i think we we need to make sure that we don't nominate others even outsiders but the the more optimal richer understanding of domination happens within sub-global communities that we can that are small and cohesive enough that we can that, that we can uh, control democratically my issue is it's not that you need a problem or a common problem or a common enemy in order to get anything going my issue is more that when we don't have a common problem or a common enemy then we have no reason to worry too much about um about the significance of these transnational dynamics because because exactly most of the most important issues would will be issues that will happen at home I don't think that this is ever likely to happen in real life. I think it's very, very difficult. But the reasoning is more of that kind. It's not you need a common enemy as, as a mechanism of social psychology, but it's more, it's only when there is a common enemy that you need to get this off the ground. Okay. Great. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, Miriam, do you have another two minutes or do you have to leave now? Uh, one. <laughs> one. Okay. So, so we've been discussing um, and Pettit um, uh, a few few days ago, and um, Pettit actually thinks that one of the problems is that there's interstate domination, and that the weaker states they should build alliances so as to combat the, the potential domination and exercise of interference of the of the stronger states, and um, in a sense. It seems difficult because the free rider problems among the weaker states, weaker states to uh, avoid coalescing in this way. Um, and um, the basic problem seems to be power asymmetries between states. And you seem to be quite optimistic that there can be this solidarity among republics despite huge differences in their in the power that they actually have. And how would you respond to that question? Because many well, students actually thought that there's no no way to solve the problem of power asymmetries between states and then the other point is we've discussed in the other class issues of the the size of the republics where the federalists and um, madison in particular argues that bigger sizes of republics are actually better because they're less prone to factionalism and you seem to be arguing that if they're too big then there's not enough solidarity so avoiding too big a size of a polity is actually something something positive um, and so yeah. regarding that is it is it really the case that having these nation state of the size of western european countries is a, is a good thing or isn't it actually that we have too much nationalism we have too much factionalism in the international society in the global society because in a sense these polities are still too small there's too much group-based interest too much group lo loyalty that actually prevents the promotion of, of bigger projects, um, similar to um, the concern that Dimitrios raised. And feel free to respond to whatever you, you feel. You yeah, very, brief, very briefly. Very yeah. briefly, because I'm I'm sorry, I'm um, I'm uh, I'm solo parenting for six days, so it yeah. means that I there's there's no one else that can pick up the kids, so yeah. it's yeah. it's me or me. <laughs> so very quickly. Um, um, so first of all, my worry about not having two excessively big republics is not solidarity or not straightforwardly solidarity is more democratic accountability, democratic, the quality of internal democratic control. Okay. Yeah. So this is what I think, uh, you know, and so again, I don't think as a Republican, I, I think that the, 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 the business of Republicans is messy. It's about finding a balance between different things. So yes, there's some price to pay in having certain things but the price um countries that are too small or too homogeneous inside 
but there's that danger in going in the opposite direction too, in terms of, of, of having maybe, maybe you have the ideal qualities in, in terms of internal diversity of the demos, but you have a demos that cannot govern itself democratically. So it's more of that kind. On the first uh, thing, so, so I think the difference between me and Patit is really that I am transnational in, in that the issue is not so much one of uh, weak states versus large states, because I don't think that's where most of the action is in terms of global injustice. I think uh, I think most of the action is, is, is uh, I mean, we could disagree about this, but let's say at least there's a lot of the action that is about, um, is about um, social groups within states and cutting across different states, right? Mm -hmm. So the kind of scenario that I'm suggesting is not one of coalitions of the of weak jurisdictions against large jurisdictions, but about um, certain social groups that the current system has taught are pitched against one another, right? They're, 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 they're people are pitched against one another and they don't need to be if they realize that they can actually operate at levels that are not just the global ones, right? So I'm really thinking about, um, about uh, you know, small savers, workers, precarious workers in different jurisdictions rather than, you know, weak and strong, across weak and strong, small and large countries, mm -hmm. rather than weak versus strong states. That's the kind of picture that I have in mind. Okay. Thanks very much. Very helpful. You're welcome. Well, we're at the end of the session now, so please join me in thanking Miriam for a wonderful talk. And great discussion. I'm so sorry that I can't hang out, but unfortunately, it's a it's a bit of an unfortunate uh, perfect storm of. Uh... Yeah, we look forward to, to having you at another occasion, and you may have a drink in your honor then at some point later. <laughs> yes, I hope I, I hope I can come soon. Bye yeah, bye. Great. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.